So welcome everyone. My name is uh, Josh Gentob. I head up partnerships at Appear Here and I will be hosting this evening. Uh, for those of you that don't know us, Appear Here is the world's leading marketplace uh, to rent retail space. You can think of us a bit like Airbnb for retail. Um, we started out with a mission to create a world where anyone with an idea can find a space to make it happen. So business, like, business leaders like you guys are at the heart of Appear Here and we always wanna do everything in our power to support you guys, uh, which is why we started what is known as the underground session because it originally started in an underground station uh, as a way to bring our community together and share inspiration, stories and advice. Uh, and we obviously wanted to continue that um, and continue to bring the community together and share advice when our community need it most. So as I said, today we're testing for the first time online uh, our under lockdown session. And so thank you very much for joining us. Uh, it's very exciting. And before I get started, I just want to do a quick uh, house rules. The panel, this beautiful panel of squares you can see here, uh, the talk will last about 35 minutes, followed by about a 10 minute Q&A. Hopefully we have some time. Uh, so you should see a Q&A chat feature at the bottom. Uh, please send over any questions you have for the panelists and I'll try and read them out at the end. So to kick off, um, we're talking about restaurants and, and obviously it's been a tough sort of decade for the hospitality industry. Uh, but set, having said that, we've seen more people set up shop than ever before, which is amazing. Uh, that was, however, before the pandemic. Um, and now, unfortunately, it's turning to a bit of a fight for survival. But wherever there's change, there's opportunity. So over the course of this conversation, we're going to hear from four very distinct voices sharing their experiences on how to plan, uh, how they adapt, and their hopes for the future. So without further ado, I'm going to introduce this uh, great group of panelists. We're very, very lucky to have all four of them with us today. Uh, and I'm gonna start with David Abramovich, who is the founder of Grind. Uh, David founded Grind in 2011 when he took over his father's Shoreditch mobile home shop on Old Street Roundabout. Uh, and since Grind has grown to become a cult East London coffee brand. I'm sure most of you are aware of it comprising of 11 locations, including cocktail bars, restaurants, and state-of-the-art coffee roastery. Today, David's brand Grind at Home coffee range is, can be found in Selfridges, Ocado, Holland and Barrett. It's done an amazing job. So we're very happy to have David here. Next, I want to introduce Michaela Filippo, who's the brand director of BBC. Michaela has worked in the food industry for over 10 years, uh, and notably, has included supporting startups for the Dusty Knuckle, designing brands and developing menus for Instagram hits such as Farm Girl, and launching restaurants like Pachamama and Chikama. Currently, she's a brand director of BBC, as I mentioned, um, who represent Creme, Ahipoki, North Orderly Canteen, or NAC, and she heads up brand development and marketing for the group. So amazing insights there. Uh, Rick Campbell, who's the co-founder of Cricket, uh, Rick founded Crick in 2015 with his university friend and chef, Will Bowlby, uh, after a four year stint in the city in corporate finance. Uh, Cricket became uh, uh, sort of, well, London-wide, uh, country-wide known hit um, as a casual Indian eatery, uh, started in a shipping container in Pop Brixton, and since then have opened up three more restaurants in Soho, Brixton, White City, um, and Rick's focused on the brand, growth strategy, and maintaining company values. And finally, uh, we're very lucky to have Krista Silva here, who's the founder of Notting Hill Fish Shop. Uh, Chris has had over 20 years experience working in brand management for companies such as AB InBev, Mars, and P&G. And after moving to the UK, he spent the last eight years consulting and investing in a number of consumer entrepreneurial projects. Uh, and his latest venture finds him resurrecting a local fishmonger in Notting Hill and transforming it into the chef's supermarket just in time for London's lockdown. 
So thanks for joining us, guys. We're very lucky to have you here. I'm excited to, to hear your thoughts on, on the restaurant industry. It's a very challenging time. And I want to start by talking about um, talking about survival. Um, so in the last month, and unfortunately probably for months to come, whether your doors are open and shut, it's going to be about survival. And survival often comes down to those who are most able to adapt and, of course, a bit of sheer good luck. So to start off, I wanted to ask all of you, what are the challenges you're, you're currently facing and what changes you're trying to make big or small to uh, adapt for the future? Uh, and I wanted to start by asking Chris that question. I know it, it's still relatively early days for the Notting Hill Fish Shop, but you've had to adapt pretty quickly. Yeah, I think we were lucky insofar as you know, we, we, we sell produce. Um, we, we had uh, a little cafe attached to the, um, to the fish shop that we were developing, but adjusted um, pretty quickly, or I guess changed it pretty quickly once we sort of anticipated what was going on and really expanded our produce offering. Um, so what, you know, and so that was to basically um, to take, make us, uh, to, so we weren't over reliant on fish basically. Um, and, you know, I think it was just, a, it was, a, um, it was a, it was, it was a, just a perfect moment where I was able to sort of also, also help my friends who had overexposure to the restaurant industry. We could see that they, you know, their businesses were about to suffer. They were going to have to lay off a lot of people. So mates of mine, the Heenans at HG Walter, I decided, you know, just come and play in my space. I've got, you know, I've got a gallery, I've got a fishmonger in a gallery and I sort of treat it like a lab. You know, so it's like live product development. So I asked them to come on board and they don't pay any rent. That would be a technically breach of my lease. It's, it's subletting. They just, it's just for them to, you know, to, to basically send money back to the factory so they don't have to lay guys off. Um, but also it just strengthens my proposition. Um, I also got Natura in to do the same. So um, it's strong brands, well-known consumer brands, um, for, for foodies anyway. Um, and we've just added on top of that. So, um, and that has seen us like increase you know, increase our football revenue, whatever you name it, you know, like dramatically. Um, but it's also made us, it's, we were no, we're no longer dependent on fish for revenue We you know, we sell just as much bread and, and, um, and meat and cheese and vegetables um, now. So yeah, um, that's, just, that's simply it. Amazing. And you come, you've sort of become a necessity store already, which is fantastic. Yeah. We were lucky. We looked at we looked at some leading markets. Singapore, primarily. Italy um, was advised by some good mentors on what might potentially happen. We, um, you know, as a sort of a smart defensive mover, re-registered the business as a, as a supermarket back after half term. Um, and then I asked myself, when this was all unfolding rapidly, well, what if it was a supermarket? Like, you know, if that if that was a creative brief, what would it look like? And um, and you know, this is what we ended up with, which is basically all the chef's preferred suppliers under one roof, which is not a chef proposition, but it's for sort of all our foodie um, consumers who you know, aspire to that. Amazing, amazing. Uh, and David, uh, I'd, I'd love to hear from you because you've obviously been doing this for, for over a decade. You've had Grime for a long time. Um, what, have the, what are the changes that you've made and what have you been looking at to, to adapt here? Not quite a decade yet, about eight and a half years. Let's not let's not age me any more oh, than I'm already aging. Um, <clears throat> look, I mean, this has been, without a doubt, the craziest, most stressful, most difficult eight weeks, six weeks, however long it's been, imaginable. Um, you know, we went from one day. We had 300 people in 11 locations working all day, every night, all day and all night to, you know, deliver what we do to tens of thousands of people a week. And then, you know, within 72 hours or so, it was, it was shut. Um, you know, and that means, you know, just the, just the logistics of doing that were huge. And the team were, were amazing working together to secure the sites, get rid of stock, you know, move around. And, and then... And then you you know this been been on this crazy journey of what's Rishi going to say next and what does furlough mean and you know what what's happening and what are the rules and just trying to navigate this whole thing and trying to you know trying to balance looking after our people with ensuring the survival of the business you know um, during that first week there were businesses laying off hundreds 
groups of people, um, well-known businesses. Um, we avoided doing that because I felt that the Chancellor was going to do something. So, you know, we, we avoided the vast majority of that. Um, the furlough system came out. Um, at first, it seemed great, although they've now clarified it to uh, exclude service charge, uh, which is a major problem for all restaurant staff. And it's something that, you know, I'm certainly banging the drum about in every bit of press and every interview that I do. Um, and, you know, the two, the two big problems for the industry now are landlords uh, and staff. You know, how do we support the staff and how do we deal with landlords? Um, so, you know, that's, that's that side. And then we have our, uh, we have a coffee roastery and we make coffee and we make coffee pods and we put them into, you know, hopefully some people would have seen them, you know, pink tins like this. Um, and we ship those out, uh, and, you know, ship them out to subscribers um, and to individual orders. And that business has now grown 1,500% since we went into lockdown. So we're now shipping out five or 600 parcels a day from our fulfillment center, and it's ramping. To be honest, the only limit on it, limit on it at the moment is how quickly we can get stock in from around the world. So we still have the team there working, and we have the digital team working, and you know, that's an amazing opportunity. And we, fortunately, we've been working on that for a year to 18 months. So we're not now do that anyway. And this has just come as a boost. Now, it still needs to grow another four times to start offsetting what we've lost through the high street. You know, we were taking, we were taking 300 grand a week or something through our high street stores. And, and that's gone to literally zero. So it's just... I mean, I could talk for about two hours about what the last two months has been like and probably write a book around it. But um, it's just, you know, you just it's just every day trying to make the best decisions you can based on information that changes every day, government schemes which change every day, and a complete unknown about are you back to normal in three months or are we living with this virus for 10 years? Like... Uh, uh, yeah and then what is normal i guess exactly yeah um, michaela you're working with um three amazing brands at the moment uh what's the, been the real shift for them at the moment for you guys um yeah i think you know everything changed very quickly and the businesses already saw the impact a couple of weeks before the lockdown even happened um we're quite lucky that two of our brands were already very well prepped for delivery um ahi pokey was already on delivery creme was already doing quite well with uh, cookie deliveries but we actually made the decision um as the lockdown happened to close everything uh, we didn't feel comfortable having staff coming in we just wanted to sit it out for a bit um recently we've come back on to delivery and we've seen an incredible, uh, incredible support from our customers. People clearly really want to get their cookies delivered to them and, you know, treat themselves and treat their friends. Lots of people gifting people. Um, so that's been really positive. And I think something that we might be thinking about now is how can we get the product further? Obviously, delivery is going to be a big part of the business for now and until the lockdown's over and probably for the future. Um, so how can we get the product further, you know, figuring out the logistics to deliver cookies further, maybe to deliver pokey further, but definitely turning towards delivery as a focus. Yeah, great. Uh, and, and then Rick, yours, I mean, your, your product is a luxury product and it's, and it's certainly an experience for those of you that have been to a cricket restaurant, you'll know. Um, how are you guys, how have you guys been managing this? Well, I think, um, much the same as David, really, uh, in terms of uh, echoing his thoughts, you know, perhaps on a little bit of a smaller scale, we have 70 staff. Uh, um, to go from three and a half thousand customers a week to zero, you know, 100 grand a week to zero income. You know, we don't unfortunately have this, the, 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 the side business that David has in terms of, um, you know, selling coffee to the whole of London. We have nothing. Um, it's been incredibly difficult, um, you know, the staff have been probably our number one focus, um, but balancing that with the survival of the business, I mean, if the business doesn't survive, there are, the, the staff don't survive, so they kind of come hand in hand. And, um, you know, as with David, I was, I, I was delighted that we didn't make those redundancies like a lot of restaurant businesses did. We, we also um, bided our time and waited for the announcements and, 
and um, yeah, I was I'm pleased to say that you know, 99% um, of our staff were furloughed. So uh, it's been incredibly difficult. Um, we yeah, we closed all our restaurants on the 17th of March. Uh, pivoted the business quite quickly to delivery, uh, and that was very successful for four days, particularly in Brixton. The main point of that was to to, to, to preserve jobs that we thought we were going to have to um, uh, lose uh, and obviously to provide some kind of income. Um, but once the government made those uh, announcements with regards to furlough and um, other um, support schemes, and um, as Michaela said, you know, this really this, the health and safety aspect of it, uh, we pulled everything after four days and uh, I've had um, absolutely zero operations going since um, about the 22nd of March, I think it was. So, uh, yeah, it's been very difficult. I've, I've run away to Suffolk to my parents' house actually for now, um, hoping to be back in London in a couple of weeks and uh, we're going to be hopefully doing something, um, perhaps re-looking at delivery, assuming our staff are happy to work and, and it makes sense. Uh, and also a few other things, uh, uh, an e-commerce platform, uh, something we were already looking at before actually coronavirus happened, but um, there'll be a lot more on there now than there was before. So. Yeah, really, really difficult times, unprecedented, hard for everyone, every business. Um, but uh, yeah, and so unpredictable, don't really know how, how, to, how to plan one week to the next. You, you have to have a plan, you know, um, but you, you almost feel uh, stupid predicting things that, that, want, that change one week to the next. Um, you don't want to be too uh, positive and you, um, because you can look stupid. You don't want to be too negative because you know, it can't go on forever and we want to get back to where we were. Um, you know, people want to go out and we'll want to go out and want to eat and drink again. Um, as and when that happens, we don't know yet. So, yeah, yeah very difficult. Um, so something you just touched upon there is what I want to talk about next, which is exploring business online, uh, which obviously for all industries, we've seen a sort of rush to pivot online. Um, and unfortunately, the restaurant industry is sort of less set up to deal with that um and obviously you know two main senses you need to engage for, for the food industry is you know taste and smell and that is is very difficult uh, online um david i'd love to go back to you um because you've obviously started selling online as you said before the pandemic started can you share some examples of how you've seen this done well you know if it's you guys or or elsewhere, like how have restaurants been able to pivot online? Yeah, look, it, it, it's, it's a tricky one because it's very specific to, uh, to the business, you know, and in the same way that we've stayed away from Deliveroo and, uh, historically, and we've done that just because we just don't particularly fit Deliveroo that well. Like we sell the, the most, the thing we sell the most of is cocktails. The next thing we sell the most of is coffee and they just don't travel well. Whereas if you run a burrito business, those things are like designed to be wrapped up and transported, right? So in the same way, like certain restaurant businesses or brands have an opportunity to sell things online and, and some don't, and it's very, very specific. So there are obvious examples of, you know, brands that have pushed into supermarkets, you know, selling branded products, like, you know, Nando selling sauce and marinades and, uh, you know, the famous one of Pizza Express putting pizzas in, did that devalue the brand or did it not? So it's, it's, it's very hard. You know, I think we, you know, I, I've become less and less bullish on restaurants and the, and the high street as a whole over the last two years, just because I've just seen, I've seen it get tougher and tougher. You know, we, we're a, we're a strong brand with really good following and lots of customers, but it's still really hard to, to, to make these things, you know, consistently very profitable because of business rates and because of staff costs and Brexit and the, the dollar and the price of everything going up and just pressure, pressure, pressure. Um, and then last year, you know, last year was, was the weather didn't help, the elections didn't help, nothing helped. Um, so, you know, we made the decision or I made the decision about 18 months ago to basically, you know, spend less money on sites and more money on things like franchising into, uh, you know, working with our franchise partners to move into travel locations and then setting up this large coffee roasting facility and starting to send products to people and 
We recently launched with Soho House as their global coffee supplier. So just basically doing, spending money on things other than just opening restaurant units, because even though we love doing that, it's just, you know, one of the things coming out of this might be a bit of a reset of the relationship between tenants and landlords, but you know, it was just, it's just incredibly, it's just incredibly challenging. So for us, I think we have a product that is very suitable for, uh, you know, direct to consumer stuff. So it's something that we consume every day. We've all been conditioned to want a really high quality cup of coffee at home. We use it very regularly, you know, you're a one a day or a two a day or four a day. So, uh, it doesn't need to be refrigerated. It doesn't really perish. So for lots of reasons, it is suitable. And I think all brands have to try and figure out, you know, how they can adapt what they're doing to be, to be suitable to the new world, be that through direct consumer internet stuff or through delivery or click and collect um, and combinations of those things. Yeah. And Michaela, you have a really good sense of what's going on from the brand side. Um, so you know, love to hear from you about what brands could be doing or restaurants could be doing to keep their customers and their community engaged during this time where they're not necessarily opening their doors to people. Yeah, I think, um, you know, I'll admit it's, it's been quite a challenge, especially at the beginning. Um, there's only so many times you can do a TBT, you know, to, to the golden era of when you actually had customers in your restaurant or, you know, just sharing dishes that people aren't actually going to be able to eat. Um, as much as, you know, that's what, that, that's what people like to see. Um, but I think, you know, brands really need to remember that behind every restaurant and behind every food brand, there's humans and there's people. And I think something that I've really enjoyed seeing some of the restaurants that I follow is, um, you know, the Instagram live cooking. I mean, you know, made cacio e pepe with Tim Ciadatan from Padella. <laughs> that was amazing. You know, so I think bringing bringing your audience into your home. You know, we're all at home. We're all glued to our phones. Um, making sure that you're not being tone deaf, just keeping in mind what the mood of the city is at the moment. Um, it's just, it's, yeah, it's, it's just being, being, being the human, bringing out the human side to the brand, um, bringing them into your home, introducing them to your chefs, introducing them to what you're doing at home. Um, and I think also just making sure that we're all remaining optimistic and putting out positive messages and positive content. Um, but I will admit that it's, it is, it has been a challenge. It's, it's been a challenge when it feels inappropriate to share pictures of the food of your restaurant. Um, you know, some accounts I've seen have just gone completely dormant and, you know, restaurants have said, see you on the other side, <laughs> which yeah. is another way of doing it. Um, yeah, I, I've been, I found, seen, seen a lot of positive content out there, which is good. Okay. And um, Rick, that's actually sort of brings me on to you, which is that you guys, as you mentioned, you, you tested delivery for about four days um, before deciding to shut it down. Talk to us about the pros and cons, if, if you're happy to, about like home delivery service. What, you know, what damage can it do? What are the benefits? Well, quick, quick it's not, we've never really, we've never done a delivery service. Uh, I don't think um, our food travels particularly well. And, um, you know, the restaurants have always been a, a capacity where actually we don't have any more space to do delivery. Uh, we've never been a delivery brand. We're happy with um, being a restaurant, a restaurant only. But in times of need, I think you have to adapt. As we've all been discussing, you know, you really do uh, need to get creative and pivot your business. And I, and I know delivery is not necessarily getting creative, but it is an option. I think... Um, I think delivery actually works best when you run it alongside your normal course of business. You get better economies of scale. I think it's hard to make money from a dark kitchen or, you know, um, you, you really have to do the numbers otherwise it doesn't work. Uh, and I think we, we kind of saw that in the Brixton site, actually, you know, it, it did really do quite well. Um, you know, it could be something that we use alongside when we reopen, uh, whenever that is, how busy are we going to be? We still don't know. Um, that will depend on the government restrictions and uh, customer appetite. But uh, yeah, I think it can work. But we adapted our, we adapted our menu slightly. Um, we did a, short, um, a small uh, quality over quantity, well packaged, um, a few more curries on there. Um, so yeah, we, we were successful. I'm, I'm glad we've got it in our armory and we've certainly probably, I can see us definitely using it over the next six months, nine months, 
Um, but ideally, I would like to get back to just being three full-blown restaurants yeah. and, and not doing delivery. That said, you know, it, it, there's, I would never say no to doing to doing a dark kitchen somewhere else with a with a specific cricket menu that doesn't cannibalise the restaurants. Why not? Um, never say never. But yeah, I would like to get back to our normal course of business as soon as possible. To be honest, I'm sure. Uh, and Chris, you actually started a, a delivery business in four weeks. Is that right? An online business. It was a bit, yeah, a bit, a bit shorter than that actually. But um, yeah, look, it was in the pipeline um, uh, because you know, into, in, in order to spread our reach, um, I wanted to go online. There are customers that simply can't get to the store, so it was always in the pipeline. But it was deprioritized as we were just trying to deal with the demand in the store over the past six months that we've been in existence. Um, but yes, again, just sort of seeing what was happening, um, uh, you know, in Asia and then in, in Europe as we got back from half term, sort of, you know, late Feb. Um, you know, I've got, I've got, I over trade, dare I say, on, on, um, on, on consumers that are in high risk categories. A, a lot of my customers from the business that I effectively, you know, bought from, from you know, the, the Kensington Place fish shop, they're all 70 plus. Um, they are, you know, they're all the people that hold the money in the big houses in Kensington, Holland Park, and Notting Hill. Now, you know, um, you know, as soon as this this uh, this ludicrous idea, you know, it was kind of a joke. No one took it seriously. This idea of self-isolating. You know, when remember when that first emerged, um, you know, people were just like, "What the hell is this?" And people were just throwing around as banter. Um, and, you know, I, when I said, like, "What if this is true?" And you know, actually, God, this really affects you know fifty percent of my customers. Um, I'm, I don't have a system to deal with them. So um, I basically, you know, I, 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 re, I put, put it to the top of the priority list and um, got the right talent in place. And with the, with the help of a peer here and, um, and some of the, their network, actually, your network, um, I was able to pull together a, a digital team and we, we had a site up in less than a week. Wow. Um, and, you know, had it all shot, all the rest of it. Now there was loads of glitches in it, whatever. But, you know, the problem there is, um, you know, these consumers order Ricardo and they buy on Amazon. And, you know, these guys have spent billions in development and had years and years of development. And they're the benchmark. Um, so, you know, like it's, it's, it's very difficult to get that up and to, and to, to you know, to, to provide the same level um, of experience and, and, and service. But, um, yeah. We, 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 we got it done fast. There are ways to get it done fast. Well, evidently, I mean, that's, that's amazing. Um, yeah. Actually, I wanted to, to touch on all of you very quickly, because this seems like a, a, a hot topic at the moment for all of you, which is how can delivery services like Deliveroo adapt their offering to make it, you know, to support restaurants right now? Because everyone, Certainly in the restaurant industry seems to have strong opinions on delivery uh, and I, I understand it's not always the easiest to work with them. Delivery and others, um, what, what could they be doing? I mean, Rick, you're a good example of someone who's <laughs> interested but reserved on, you know, what could convince you to, to work with these guys? Well, we, we've only got four days worth of experience, so I don't want to speak for everyone who uh, works with the del delivery. Or what I would say is, I mean, I was amazed how quickly we got set up. I mean, we did have a, a menu from our side, but they were incredibly quick. You know, I was thinking about setting up in three days time and they said, were telling me I could get set up tonight. So it really is an insane um, business that the, the support is there if you want to do it. You know, obviously the big burner contention, and it's not just with Deliveroo, it's with Uber Eats and, and I, probably Justy and a few of the others, is the, the slice they take. Um, you know, it's a big slice. Everyone, um, 25, 30, 35 percent, depending on who you speak to, that's a massive chunk of your gross revenue. Not your net revenue, gross revenue. Um, so it's incredibly hard, like I said, to make the numbers work. Um, but you know, it, it, people need it right now. Uh, like I said, supplementing it with with the normal course of business is, it also works really well. Um, but uh, I, I understand also that uh, they've they've changed the payment terms as well to help people with cash. So I think they, I think. Again, I'm only speaking from four days experience, but I believe they used to pay you your money every, every, every two weeks. And I think now they're doing it next day. So that's incredibly helpful, obviously, to people where cash is the most important thing right now. So, uh, you know, there are many pros and cons to delivery. I think the most difficult one for us as restaurants that love serving beautiful, tasty, warm food is that as soon as it goes out the door of your building um, to a, a rider or a driver, 
and it, um, it's out of your hands and you really have no idea at what state it's going to end up at the other end. And, you know, speaking from my experience of using delivery, you know, when, when that food arrives, if it arrives cold and all over the bot, all over the bag, you don't blame the delivery driver, you blame the restaurant. And I think that's, that's the, the problem. And we're always wary, wary of, uh, we can only do so, so much at our end. And then we're, you know, relying on, on, on that as soon as it goes outside the door, out the door and, and to the customer, what happens between then? Yeah. It's something we, we talked about, previously, which is like when you have this luxury product, it's, it's sort of difficult to hand it over to somebody else and say, I'm, 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 I'm I, it's nice that you call it luxury. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, I, want, I want people to know that they can, they, they can eat in cricket and have a really great meal and lovely drinks for 30 quid a head. So uh, <laughs> it's not that luxury. <laughs> Does anyone else want to want to jump in with, with the delivery delivery Michaela, you guys, use it quite a lot is that right yeah i mean i think i would agree that it has been incredible how quickly they can turn turn around uh your you know your online account we last week put knack north audley canteen on delivery um we decided to do it pr prior to the lockdown then we kind of decided not to and very quickly we were able to activate it um you know the the people that work there were our account manager was working on the weekend she was working in the evenings changing photos for us changing copy so it was really helpful to have that um, support. Um, obviously, there are some people that take an issue with the with the commission, but you know, from my perspective, it's just really unfortunate that you can't get the brand across um, on their page or in the packaging mm -hmm. unless you invest a lot of money. Um, that that header image, you know, you depend so much on what that header image looks like because as people are scrolling through it's really the one thing that's going to capture their attention. Um, so yeah, I mean, I, I, can't, I can't really say anything bad about it because we're now dependent on it in many ways. Um, but definitely, you know, if you, if you, if, if I was to give some advice to them or if I was able to change it, um, I would say something to do with the delivery range maybe because we can only reach, you know, a very small audience that are close to the restaurant. Uh, definitely the the whole handing over your product and not knowing how it's going to arrive. I was sent a photo of cookies that were completely obliterated <laughs> the other day. The box was covered in chocolate and I couldn't actually understand whether the driver had had an accident or something because there's no other way that they would have arrived like that. Um, but yeah, otherwise it's, you know, it's incredible that we have this service at the moment and, you know, we're going to be on, dependent on it for a while, I think. No one has to say anything bad about delivery. I love it. <laughs> I can't. Um, <laughs> no, I'm happy to say I'm bad, bad about delivery. Yeah, I'm on, I'm on board too. Oh, come on, guys. Feel free to share. Go, David. I, I, just, I, I just, look, I use delivery sometimes, and I totally get it, but there are, there's a big part of me that thinks it's not particularly working for any party involved, really, you know. I need delivery. Amazon just well, Amazon just bailed out Deliveroo with five hundred million dollars before it went bust. You know, it doesn't actually make money for them, even though they've cranked up a lot of money on high valuations. You know, it sells it sells products to people and they receive them, and it's not nothing like as good as an experience as going to the restaurant. And the product doesn't you know doesn't travel well in a lot of cases, and the restaurants tend to sell the lower margin products, which is the food, without getting the high margin products, which is the alcohol and the coffee. And then Deliveroo takes 30% plus that or something, which is like 33%. And if, you, if your cost of goods is six, uh, is another 30%, maybe even a bit more, that's leaving not a lot to pay the staff and to pay the overhead. So I'm not particularly sure that any, and often the consumer, you know, pays a couple of quid more for the dish than they do in the restaurant because the restaurant's trying to offset that crazy fee that they have to pay Deliveroo. So like, I'm not sure that any party particularly wins in this merry-go-round. And I think a lot of restaurants have become addicted to the revenue without actually really analyzing the numbers and realizing the profitability of it. So I'm not, I'm not really sure it's a force for good in the restaurant industry, to be honest. Uh, how, many, how many times do you go in a restaurant that are, uh, are operating Deliveroo um, uh, at the same time. And, you know, the service is affected. It's, it, service can be disgraceful, actually. You know, you've got um, half a dozen Deliveroo drivers to 
today. And, um, you know, David mentioned about hiking the prices. I mean, that's something I've, I, like I said, I use Deliveroo occasionally as well, maybe once every couple of weeks. And, uh, you know, you see something that would normally be £10 a dish for the dish in the restaurant, and then you're paying £14 on Deliveroo because they're trying to offset their costs. It's mad. You know, the, the average spend is, is probably, four, I think our average spend um, when we did it for that four days was 40 quid, 45 quid, you know, mm -hmm. and, and that's probably maybe, it's going to be, be no more than two people for two people. It might even be one person. It's mad, madness. But, um, yeah, I think a lot of, a lot of uh, businesses have turned to it uh, maybe as a sort of uh, a, way, a, way, a way out of what otherwise would be maybe a failing business. Um, it's very difficult to, 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 to isolate it and see how would it do, um, you know, aside from that, how would, would their business do without it now that it's, it's there? Um, yeah, yeah, difficult. To, I think you um, need to take, I think, I think you need to take a step back when you think about Deliveroo. Um, it's, I, I think, you know, it, it, it actually snaps into focus how important it is to have a strong brand. Um, you know, like, so back in the days, classically, you know, the, the days when the, man, the, manu, the consumer goods manufacturers used to dictate to the supermarkets the prices and what they'd list. I mean, they could because that's what drew customers into the store. And then that power dynamic shifted probably about 20 years ago when the likes of, you know, your Waitrose and your m and started producing their own private label stuff. And all of a sudden they understood that they owned the customer and whoever owns the customer is king. And so from that point of view, I think like delivery would have a fucking brilliant business, but they don't look after you. They know exactly who they are and they own the customer, right? And so they will take that chunk. And if you don't own the customer, then you know, it's kind of your bad luck. I think that's the way they kind of see it from a commercial point of view. So you know, to, to you know, what we're doing, we, we, I refuse to use delivery. We don't need to use them. Um, you know, I, I'm aligned with all your thoughts around you know, it just compromises experience and delivery. Um, and um, so, you know, but there are other delivery options. You yeah. don't have to just look at Deliveroo as a, you know, as a, as a fulfillment partner. No, of course, of course. Um, so moving on quickly, because uh, we're running out of time, I want to talk, touch upon the idea of support or, or lack thereof uh, from the government. Uh, and I know, David, you're, you, you've been quite an advocate of, of, making some changes or some action from the government. Uh, and I know we're talking about calls for nine month rent free uh, periods. Do you think this is a viable option? You know, what would you, what would you recommend David? Yeah, look, as, as I mentioned earlier, I think, you know, on the face of it, the furlough system is amazing. And I think, you, you know, during the longest week of my life, which was between when Boris said, don't go to restaurants and when on the Monday and, the Chancellor announced, fur announced furlough on the Friday. Um, you know, I was thinking, I didn't expect them to come out with 80%. Um, it was, I thought it was incredible. You know, that's almost something, that's something coming out of Sweden or somewhere like that, right? Not the UK. So um, that was really great. Unfortunately, I, and look, I do understand that the government is dealing with something which is unprecedented. They're trying to write legislation under huge pressure and it's complex. But, you know, you know hospitality and, and retail and high street businesses are the, are the ones that need this the most. And I think there's a lot of businesses who are furloughing staff um, just because they've got the opportunity to do so and why shouldn't they? And I think as, as the government kind of dialed into the detail around all of this, uh, they, they clearly had to clarify hundreds of things. And I think what happened was they started to realize that many more people were going to take advantage of this than they've realized. So, you know, and management consultants and huge big five accountancy firms and all that kind of stuff, we're going to start following people. And suddenly, you know, the 2 billion a day became 4 billion a day and they started having to say, or whatever it is now, who knows? I don't think they even know, but they started basically saying no to detail questions that were going to cost them more money. And the trunk service charge, you know, that was a detail and probably someone said, look, the swing on this is, you know, X million pounds a day. And they said no. And ultimately, it's kind of the people that arguably the system was designed for who have suffered there. I think that's a major problem um, and, you know, pretty unfair on, on those people. Um, and then I think 
The other big problem, of course, that you mentioned is rent. And this is a really complex one because, you know, there's a whole, there's a whole chain there. Like clearly I'm saying to our landlords, we can't pay rent now and we can't pay rent in the future because the government's told me to close my restaurant. So I pay you a rent to be in a place like Liverpool Street or London Bridge where, you, you know, hundreds of thousands of people go past every day. That's kind of the point. But if there's no one there and my doors are closed, why would I pay you the rent? But equally, you know, they've got their own banking requirements. They've got people to pay. They might have mortgages to pay. So, you, you know, the timeout system, which is being advocated, is, is one solution. Um, whatever the solution is, it needs to run the whole way up the chain. Like, you can't really just fix one part of it without fixing all of it. Because, you know, I think the, everyone is going to have to take pain in this situation throughout the, throughout the whole chain. I think hopefully... You know, hopefully it might reset relationships slightly between landlords and tenants moving yeah. forwards. Um, and that could be one of the good things to come out of it. But, you know, the government, in my mind, you know, to summarise, needs to fix two things. They, they need to reverse the decision on service charge because, you know, like it or dislike it, Tronk is how all restaurants or the vast majority run. They couldn't survive without it unless everyone wants to start paying £15 for their smashed avocado then which they don't they, they couldn't survive without it it's, it's approved by the government it runs through payroll it's on everyone's pay as you earn slips it is an approved system it's not a bonus so that's just wrong they've got that wrong and then they need to fix the land the, the thing with landlords yeah absolutely um and then i'd like to just before we finish off look to to the future um obviously very unknown, very uncertain, uh, and especially in the like the IRL experience space. Um, I want to talk about you know other countries that have opened up a little bit or or left restaurants open, for example, uh, Sweden or Hong Kong that now just started to open up. Um, I'll, I'll start with Michaela on this. Do you do you think the spirit of you know, going out, going to restaurants can be preserved if there are, you know, measurements taken at the door or, or social distancing, you know, 50% capacity in the restaurant. Is, is that why people go to restaurants? Will that damage it? Um, I think, you know, six, seven weeks ago, we were all awkwardly elbow handshaking and thinking that it was bonkers. And now we're happy to stand two meters away from our friend on their doorstep to say hello. And I think that whatever measures we have to take, um, we will be fine. And Londoners are resilient and adaptable. And I think it's really, you know, it will be the, the restaurant's responsibility to be fully transparent about all of the measures that they're taking. And I would much prefer to go to a restaurant that does take my temperature at the door and has, you know, two meters apart from the tables or whatever it is than a restaurant that doesn't. Now that's me as a customer, obviously us as, you know, people running and operating restaurants, it's gonna be really difficult potentially to keep the spirit of the restaurant going and the customer service going as we want it to be when our staff are wearing masks. I just butt in, um, sorry, and ask, yeah. would you rather not go though? Because no, I, I, I don't feel really so. strong about um, about this sort of two meter spacing tables. I mean, it's farcical anyway because a lot of restaurants can't actually set the restaurant mm. like that. If you look at the upstairs of Cricket Soho, it's got an open counter, chef's kitchen, and two booths. Nothing can move, and I just think we we're in this sort of farcical situation where we're suggesting that we should be setting up the restaurant like with two meters apart. Whatever the situation happens, you're not going to be socially distancing to a point where it stops, keeps people safe. Mm. I think we have to say, look, you're, we are either open for business and we put all, um, a, you know, serious improved hygiene practices in place. Even people who have five star hygiene ratings like ourselves, you know, you can always do more. And especially with this um, in, in this scenario, but you need to give the consumer the choice as well. And I think they'll make their own choices as well. I, 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 well, I think it depends if there are any rules put in place. I mean, something yeah, that we yeah. haven't really heard from the government about is whether there are going to be rules about how we operate businesses. Mm. I've seen something quite positive come out of um, New York where de Blasio was talking about how they were going to shut down streets so that restaurants can have tables outside. 
Now that sounds like a really lovely way to live in, and, and operate in Soho this summer. But, you know, it obviously doesn't have, um, there's no longevity to that. But I think, you know, we can talk about it and we can talk about whether we will or won't do it. But it's what, it might be one of the rules to reopen that we have to have tables that are spaced apart and everyone wearing masks. And I think something in this whole, in this whole period has been, you know, looking to Asia, to how they've adapted. Um, I've seen in Taiwan, you know, they have X's on seats for where people can and can't sit. Um, mandatory masks. Uh, in Hong Kong, the Black Sheep Restaurant Group have um, released a, a manual for restaurants and how, the, how they can operate under COVID. And one of the things they talk about is a health declaration form that all customers, when they arrive, should sign a form, <coughs> as well as all delivery drivers that come into your restaurant. I mean, I don't know. I think it's, there's a lot of uncertainty here. But regardless, I think people will want to dine out. People will want to go back to restaurants. And, you know, three months under lockdown, not seeing your friends is going to make you happy to go to a restaurant, even if it means you have to sit two meters away from them. I think, I think Hong, Hong Kong is the only Soho house that is open and it's operating at 20 percent, I think. I think that's what I read today. You know? two, people, two people in the lift at any one time. You can't see yeah. half, half the tables and chairs taken out. Mandatory that's, tasks. It's, that's it's, no experience. And, and, and we can't open under that. We can't open like that. Actually, the hardest bit is, is still to come. You know, closing down and putting all your staff on furlough, that's the easy bit. What are we going to do when we open and we're 20% of our usual business, 50% of our usual business, with no other income and no furlough, or furlough goes down to 60% and it doesn't include chunk. I mean, it's, it's the hardest bit is still to come. Um, and I, I do think the government haven't, uh, uh, you know, they can't win, really. They really can't win. Um, so, yeah, difficult times to come. So I, I want to try and end on something positive before we try and get one or two questions in, um, which is which is sort of the drive towards uh, local. Um, what we're seeing now is obviously people aren't traveling and they're limited with where they can go. Um, but the one positive we've seen is people are, are going out and, and buying local. Um, and, and Chris, obviously, you're, you're a prime example of the success that this leads to. Um, you know, do you think this will last? Do you think this will continue? Um, I, you know, just I, if, if I play it the way I have, I have to anticipate that it's going to be over much sooner than everyone thinks. I hope it's over sooner than everybody thinks. I, I was, I was um, stupidly taking bets with some of my staff that um, you know, the government would get schools back and would start to get some workers back um, after this early May bank holiday. Um, that's how sort of optimistic and aggressive I am in my planning. Um, and that's the only way I can stay ahead of the game, right? So, that, you know, I, I, sure, you know, we're, we're experiencing, you know, a massive surge in business at the moment, but it, I don't, I, I cannot plan like it's going to last. Um, I think that would just not be, that just wouldn't be diligent. Um, you know, touching on what you were saying about um, local, um, I mean, yeah, it's been brilliant insofar, you know, we, we have become a center of community. Um, we practice social, social distancing, um, where, where we, you know, we have a queue formed outside. Um, you know, we, we put out chairs for our, for our customers. They are two meters apart, but we make sure that they engage with each other because the benefit of coming down to the shop is you get to see other people and you get to talk um, and you get to exchange war stories um, and all, all kinds of other notes. And, um, and then also we, um, you know, we get to talk about food and what they're cooking at the moment at home and what they're experimenting with and what they've tried that's new and risky and out of their comfort zone from our store. Um, yeah. Uh, so I personally has to get schools back. Otherwise there's going to be, you know, like there will be um, uh, an, an education crisis um, and I think they've got to get the economy kit started. I look, I see a lot of people in my shop and I've got to tell you if I'm honest and the reason why I've been aggressive in my planning, I think, I think the flu has gone through London two months ago. I've had, I mean, I've got customers who are going into Harley street and getting, um, COVID tests and they've all tested positive mm. and they've had it months ago. People went down I, in my son's a six year old at Weatherby. He's like the flu flew through there like you know end of january yeah. right so 
the government knows this, but they have to be pragmatic, right? And they have to think about the high risk categories. But at some point, they are going to have to fire things up. They do have to get kids back to school. They do have to get the, the economy fired up. Unfortunately, I do think where they will be bullish, um, oh, sorry, where I, where I think they will be strict is with hospitality. Yeah. Um, unfortunately, it pains me to say this. I really, I'm, I feel for you guys listening to, listening to the challenges and that you've faced over this past six weeks. It's fucking awful. I'm mm. so yeah, and that's and that's you know I I really empathise with that, and that's why I've done what I, my bit to, you know, like to get as many, uh, you know, redundant chefs working with us and uh, to bring in you know supplies that are overexposed to the restaurant trade just to them for t trade freely so that they can survive in our business. But yeah, um, I don't, I, you know, like I said, I, if I, as a business guy, I have to plan like it's over tomorrow. Yeah. Um, but yeah. And, and, but then, you know, and then I, I'm just optimistic and, and positive, but um, you know, the government knows what's at hand. They have to play it a certain way. They're damned if they do, damned if they don't. But I think they know that it's gone through the city already. Yeah. And Michaela, we, when we talked earlier, you had, high hopes for for local business local restaurants i feel like we're a panel of like half optimist <laughs> i'm trying to, <laughs> well, first thing's we're trying gonna to end, end on a positive note <laughs> yeah. um yeah sorry I, I think just just on that point it's it's incredible um you know looking to the local businesses that we've all turned to for dependency and support I have a local bakery here that's, you know, turned into a grocery shop. There's a queue out the door every day. They keep adding new products. They keep asking people what products they want to see. And yeah, I, I do think the opportunity when this is all over might be for people that have had a dream to open a restaurant to do something small locally because yeah, people probably will be staying at home a bit more. People might have adjusted to life at home and quite like it working from home. I mean, I know that that's going to be a big thing. People might be working from home a lot more, even after the lockdown. So um, yeah, it's, it's a question whether local, the local restaurant industry might flourish while, you know, the broader restaurant industry suffers. Yeah. Okay, fi final question to all of you, and it's a very quick one, which is that we've just been hearing how challenging the food industry is. Why do you love it? Okay, I'll start with you because you're on my screen. Uh, I love the restaurant industry for many of the reasons that we are unable to experience right now. Um, um, we're sharing it. It's, it's an incredible language. Um, it's my favorite tool for communication. Um, my favorite part of being in lockdown has been cooking and delivering food to friends. It's the one way that I can still connect through food. Delivering it at a distance, obviously, I'm not being careless. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, I don't know, it's, it's a language that everyone understands. It's universal. And um, yeah, I'm very happy to be working in this industry. Good. Anyone else want to jump in? Feel particularly passionate about their industry right now? I just, I just um, miss and love the hustle and bustle of a busy restaurant. Nothing beats it, you know, especially when it's every night of the week, not just Friday or Saturday. Um, mm. In the relationships you create with your customers and also your staff and your team um, in that environment when it's backs against the walls and um, you know uh, tough tough industry but very rewarding uh, that's what keeps you going you know you you wouldn't work you wouldn't be in this industry if you didn't love it and I think that's what keeps us all going in a really high pressured low margin industry it's, it's, it's got to be the, the reason that keeps everyone going um, and I would you know it may be a really uh, dark times right now for the industry, but I would still encourage people to get into the industry. I think if anything, they've got more time to plan it and think about um, expanding their their model right now to encompass other things. Um, and yeah, they might enter the industry where uh, an industry now where rents are not sky high, and uh, you know maybe the barriers to entry are a little bit lower. Um, so you know we, we, there are things to be positive about, and there'll be lots of opportunities certainly next year, probably more so than this year. Um, I'm, I'm going to try and get one question in before we wrap up. There, there seems to be one that's, that's sort of consistently being asked, which is, 
um, and I know that some of you guys have touched upon this already, which is like, what are the, what are the plans that you're trying to make now to make your restaurant, you know, manageable, livable in the next six months, a year, whatever it may be. Um, and are you worried that it's going to damage the brand or are you feeling, you know, positive that things will come? As Michaela says, people need to get out. They need to be with people. Um, Rick, I'll, I'll stay with you with that. Is there anything you're doing right now? I mean, I, I, there are things we are planning on doing. What I would say is that anything I do now, I would like it to be for the long term, not just to, to fill the gap temporarily. I think anything we work on right now and put our backs into, it sh I, I really hope it is for the long term. Uh, I, I, and that, I think that would be, that would make it successful. That said, <laughs> That said, almost anything will do to fill that gap right now. But you did touch upon, you know, the brand. And that, that's always a concern. We we'll come back to delivery. I mean, of course, I'm always, it's the number one thing I'm worried about is the, the damage to our brand uh, that delivery could, can do. Um, but yeah, we are working on a lot of ideas. Uh, uh, you know, a lot of stuff that people are already doing. Lena Stores is a great example of, of pivoting the business to a grocery platform. They've done incredibly well. Um, piece of pilgrims another one with the with the piece of delivery at home and patty and bun you know we're looking into things like that ourselves um but like, as i said i would really like it to be something that is for the long term not just for the short term and i think that would be um the key to success right david what about you look i think you know the honest answer is we're not doing that much you know i'm not in the sites building stuff and changing stuff and putting in tape on the floor and because because uh, what's the point like you just we have no idea what reopening looks like yet you know we're preparing a couple of sites to, to reopen for takeaway only but that's you know to be honest that's playing with the edges and that's primarily motivated by getting some people back employed and therefore trying to fix this trunk situation but the absolute you, you know the raw business decision here is stay closed for as long as possible because um because you just you can't reopen at this level of uncertainty so you know, my focus is on the side of the business which is working because, you know, the more tins of coffee and the more direct consumer stuff we can do, the more cash that generates to just basically elongate our runway of cash until the world is, is back to being something like normal again. Um, because I think it's just, there's too many unknown to even, to even try to understand what reopening looks like at the moment. The only thing that is sure is that, you know, most like eight out of 10 restaurants out there were probably not commercially viable before coronavirus. In reality, if you look at the real hard numbers, they were not businesses that were making money before. That was before coronavirus. So, you know, 25% of sales, forget it. 50%, forget it. 75%, forget it. Like, like these are, you know, there are very few, uh, you know, highly profitable restaurants out there, you know, sales need to be at 80, 90% of where they were, I would imagine, for most businesses to make them viable. So uh, until there's a route back for that, it's going to be incredibly difficult. It really is going to be difficult. So like, all I would say to everyone is if there are places that you went before this, whatever they're doing, support them if you want to go back. They said no one's going to be buying make make at home pizza kits once pizza restaurants are back open probably i would imagine but do you know what buy one while they while they're closed because you know it's supporting them now so you know so just do what you can to support the places you want to go back to when they reopen fantastic i think i think that's a good place to end it uh, support your local restaurants honestly it's it's super important um and i just want to thank there you go there you go um we're going to send out more information in the in the roundup and we'll get to some of the questions that have been answered because you have some great questions that have been asked but thank you very much all for joining us for our first ever under lockdown session we hope you enjoyed it um if you need any further help appear here our offering um we're offering running a hotline uh, consultations anything you need as far as marketing hr uh any advice we can give you based on our experts based on on the people we speak to in our community We'd love to help you. It's free. Um, so there's a calendar link in the, in the chat. So check there to book an appointment with us. And the final thing to end on is that we're still running our Space for Ideas competition. We've extended that 
for amazing businesses, startups, anyone that wants a store when this is all over to speak to their customer. Uh, you can win a free store, build out design. Uh, we want to see your amazing ideas and we want to help you get back on your feet when this is all over. But again, thank you so much for our amazing, amazing panel, the, the brilliant thoughts and, and, and inspiration from these guys. And thank you for joining us and we'll see you again at the next Under Lockdown session. Thanks, Thanks Josh. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Thanks everybody.